The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. A H O. A H O. When my husband died, A H O saved our home for the children and me. A H O stands for Assured Home Ownership. It's the name of a unique plan created by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. A low cost first mortgage is combined with life insurance protection. So the homeowner gets extra security. And if he should die, his widow inherits her home free and clear. In just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will give you further information. Listen carefully for more details on this ideal plan for homeowners offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Bogus Healer. Having recently completed another of its surveys into the field of crime, the Federal Bureau of Investigation now makes the results of that survey available to you, the listeners of this official program. The facts marshaled in this study do not make pleasant reading. For whatever the economic picture might be in other fields, business is booming in crime. Compared with the last pre-war survey, It shows that almost every crime is being committed from 4 to 68% more often. It shows that the value of property stolen in the past year in the United States amounted to more than $119 million, or slightly less than a dollar for every man, woman, and child in the country. In communities where the citizens took an active part in the war against crime, the figures showed an appreciable decrease. In the communities where the people regarded the local conditions as being a matter of concern only to the police, but not to them, there was a marked increase. Criminals are like any other brand of insect life. They tend to congregate where conditions are most favorable. The police will do their share, and if backed by your support, they will help you see to it that your city has no welcome mat out when the criminals are looking for a place to call home. Tonight's file opens in the waiting room of a small sanitarium located on the outskirts of a western city. A middle-aged woman sits reading a magazine when a door opens. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. Dr. Smith will see you now. Oh, thank you, nurse. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Mrs. Wilson. Good morning, doctor. And how do you feel today? Oh, terribly tired. I was afraid you would be. Uh, Miss Perkins? Yes, doctor? May I have Mrs. Wilson's x-rays, please? Yes, sir. Doctor, what do they show? They, uh... I'll let you see for yourself. Is it serious? I'm afraid so. Oh, dear. Here you are, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Now, here. Let me hold this up to the light for you, Mr. Wilson. You see that white line? Uh, yes, mm mm-hmm. That indicates the source of all your trouble. Your tiredness, your headaches, everything. Just that little line? Yes, And uh, there's something else. What is it? You see that blur at the end of the white line? Uh, Right there? Yes, that's right. Uh Uh-huh, yes. Mrs. Wilson, that blur indicates the presence of a malignant growth. You mean... I'm afraid it's cancer. Oh, no. No, 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 don't be alarmed. I'm sure we've caught it early enough. It can be cured. Doctor, how? Well, the... uh, method I use is highly technical. Uh, I see. I must caution you, however, that uh, it's quite expensive. Oh, I don't care. 
When can we start the treatments, Doctor? In a day or so. As soon as I've prepared everything I'll need. Oh. I'll call you as soon as I'm ready. Yes, thank you, Doctor. You're very welcome. And until you hear from me, get as much rest as you can. Yes. Yes, I will, Doctor. Goodbye. Goodbye. Eric. What is it, Alma? Has she really got cancer? How would I know? The next afternoon at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is in the teletype room when Agent Ken Randall approaches. Hello, Jim. Oh, hi, Ken. The SAC told me to check with you. Yeah, we're on a robbery case. The jewels? No, radium. Two needles of it were stolen last night in the X-ray room at Memorial Hospital. Any description on the thief? Complete, including his name. Oh, who is he? A man named George Auburn. You know anything else about him? Well, Auburn used to work at the hospital. He's reported to be a chronic alcoholic. Well, what was his job there? He'd been an orderly. Do they still have his address? Oh, we checked there, but he'd already moved. No forwarding address, I presume. All the local police are checking all the neighborhood bars for him now. How do we get in on this? Well, an attendant noticed that Auburn was driving a car with California license plates. Hmm. When the radium was discovered missing, the attendant realized that Auburn must have taken it. So he gave the police the license number. They checked. It's a stolen car, and Auburn drove it across the state line. A drunk carrying radium around is a menace, Jim. Mm -hmm. If he opens one of those packages, it would give anyone near him the worst kind of burn. Yeah, I know. What have you done? Well, I've just sent out an alarm on Auburn and on the car. Ken, let's go back over to my desk, get his record, and study it. Maybe we'll get some lead on where he's headed. you were staying here at the resort, but I certainly didn't expect to run into you the very first minute I arrived. Oh, it's grand to see you, honey. Oh, goodness, isn't this a beautiful place? Yes, yes, it is. How long have you been here? Almost two weeks. Well, I must say it seems to have done you a world of good. I've never seen you looking better. Oh, well, I'm afraid looks are deceiving. What do you mean? My doctor tells me I'm a very sick woman. Oh, Grace. I thought you promised all of us you wouldn't go to see any new doctors. But this one's different, Lucy. He's a wonderful man. What's his name? Dr. Smith. He's a specialist. In what? Oh, everything. Oh, great. Well, he is. His nurse told me. How did you happen to go to him in the first place? He uh, had an ad in the paper. A doctor with an ad in the paper? It was a very dignified ad, Lucy. Mm-hmm. Has he told you what's wrong with you? Yes. What is it? Cancer? Grace. Oh, but it's not hopeless, Lucy. Dr. Smith says he caught it in an early stage and he can cure it. Grace, I don't believe you have cancer. But, Lucy, surely... Now, look, dear, how much do you know about this doctor? What makes you so willing to accept his diagnosis? He's a very fine man, Lucy. What school did he go to? Well, I'm sure I don't know. Might be worthwhile to check on him before you go back. Oh, please don't be silly. When are you going to see him again? He's going to call me. When? Well, as soon as he's ready to give me another treatment. All right. I'll give you a few questions to ask him. Oh, Ken. Ken, hmm. anything come in on that George Auburn alarm? Not a thing, Jim. I think I found something in his record that'll help. Good. What is it? Well, while Auburn was working at the hospital, there were regular disappearances of valuable drugs. Is he an addict? No, and he wasn't suspected of the thefts until one night he came to work drunk and was fired. A few hours later, they found some morphine missing. He was picked up the next morning, but he didn't have the morphine on him. Did he admit he'd stolen it? Well, he said he'd been drinking and didn't remember. The police put a surveillance on him. That afternoon, Auburn went to the office of a man calling himself Dr. Eric Gray. The local police got a search warrant, went through Gray's office, and found the morphine there. Mm -hmm. Was this a legitimate doctor? No, it turned out that he was a quack who allegedly treated people for cancer. He was using the stolen drugs on his patients. One of them died through his mistreatment. Oh. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? Yes. Where is this gray now? I wish we knew. He wasn't in his office at the time of the search. He must have been tipped off in some way. By the time the police tried to arrest him, he'd fled from the state. 
How much could you dig up on him? Mostly that he's going to be awfully tough to find. He must be operating again. Yeah, that's logical. Ken, I'm also convinced that if we locate Gray, we'll find Auburn. Alma? Alma? Yes? Will you come here, please? I sure will. Oh, I've just had a session with Mrs. Wilson. She has a friend who has been trying to talk her out of coming here. Eric, I'm afraid you've got more trouble. What do you mean? George Auburn was just here. What? He wanted to see you. Where is he now? He went back into town. What for? I don't know. How did he know where we were? He called my mother. Well, how did she know? I wrote her. Alma, I ask you not to write anyone. I'm sorry, Eric. Well, that helps a lot. Mrs. Wilson's the wealthiest patient I've ever handled. I'm not going to lose her because of that drunken idiot, Auburn. He said he'd be back, of course. Oh, yes. Well, I want to see him as soon as he arrives. Ken, this could be a lead. On the bogus doctor? No, on Auburn. A report came in from the traffic control station at Johnson City. Did the stolen car go through? Yeah, Auburn was driving it. Oh, how come they didn't stop him? Oh, it's just one of those things, Ken. The officer didn't think about the alarm until after he'd let Auburn drive away. Oh, that's dandy. Well, we might still catch up to him. Here. Take a look at this map, will you? Uh, where are we? Oh, here. See this road here? Mm-hmm. Well, that's the road the control station is on. It's not the main highway. Now, here, this is where the hospital is that was robbed. Mm -hmm. Here's the traffic control station. Now, why would anybody use that road when the highway was available? Think he did it to avoid the police? No, there was no reason for him to suspect that there was an alarm out on him. No. I believe he took this route in order to get to this town over here. Farwell. Ken, there's a train that'll get into Farwell in the morning, and I think we ought to be on it. Auburn's here. Oh, send him in. Go in, George. Thank you, thank you. Well, greetings, Doc. Good to see you. Alma, close the door, please. See that we're not disturbed. Surely. Mm, quite a setup you got here, Doc. I, I like it even better than the last place. <laughs> Makes you look almost legitimate. Why did you come here? Well, I, I, I guess you'd say for a variety of reasons. Partly nostalgia, not seeing you in so long, and... And partly business. I'm not interested in the business phases. In fact, I'm not interested in you. Oh, now, Doc, that's a very unkind thing to say. And after all the trouble I went through, too. What do you mean? I, I, I brought you something, a present. Something that will be a, a boon to your medical career. What are you talking about? You're the man who cures cancer, aren't you? I, I got something that might really help you do it. Got it right here in this little container. You know what it is, Doc? Radium. That's real radium? Mm uh hmm. -huh. I borrowed it from the hospital. You get out of here and take that stuff with you. Now, wait a minute, Doc. This is hardly the treatment I expected. I spent my last dough getting here to see you. I thought I might negotiate a little sale with this precious ingredient. Auburn, I'm ordering you to leave. Doc. I think you should be reminded of something. The cops back home are still looking for you. I could be real mean and tell them where you are. Now, ordinarily, I wouldn't think of doing such a thing, especially to an old pal like you, but if you're going to take that attitude, if you're going to be that in hospital, then I might have to report you to the gentleman in blue. You're charming. Now, how about putting me up for the night, Doc? I've had a long day and a quantity of whiskey. I think if I had a good night's sleep, you might find me easier to negotiate with in the morning. Very well. You can stay. Splendid. Uh, you wait here a moment. I'll have Alma show you to your room. Thank you, sir. I consider you a fine host and a very sporting fellow. Alma. I'm in here. Auburn spending the night. What? I had no choice. He threatened to turn me into the police. Uh, Show him to his room, will you? Eric, if you let him stay tonight, he'll move right in. I have a way of preventing that. How? 
I'll kill him. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file which shows how your FBI protects American citizens and American homes. Now a word about another type of home protection. A plan which not only safeguards the owner during his lifetime, but also continues to protect his widow if he should die. Just listen in on this telephone conversation between a young widow and her father. Hello? Dad, listen to this news. A representative of the Equitable Society just called to deliver the canceled mortgage on our house. Yes, Fred told me that you'd own the house free and clear if he should die. <laughs> not only that, Dad... The equitable man handed me a check for all the money Fred paid to reduce the mortgage during his lifetime. This young woman's husband didn't have just an ordinary mortgage. He had an equitable, assured home ownership plan. In this plan, a low-cost first mortgage is integrated with life insurance protection. That's why the widow inherited a house that's hers free and clear. What's more, every dollar previously paid to reduce the mortgage was returned. Our plan had been operating for several years, so my refund check amounted to over $2,300. Now let's run over some other features of the Equitable Society's assured home ownership plan. First, there's the cash fund which builds up in the owner's lifetime and which may be used whenever sickness or unemployment threaten home security. Second, this cash fund may be used to cancel the mortgage well ahead of schedule. Equitable Society records show that many 20-year mortgages have been completely paid off in just about 15 years. Finally, the mortgage interest is only 4%, and there's a liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. So, for many reasons, a man may consider himself lucky if his health, age, income, and the location of his home enable him to qualify for an equitable, assured home ownership plan. For full information, see your Equitable Society representative or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Bogus Healer. The number of people who die of cancer each year in the United States, people from every section of the country and from every walk of life, is more than twice as great as the number of servicemen killed in any year during World War II. It is certainly tragic that it should be necessary for the Federal Bureau of Investigation to warn you that throughout the nation there are quacks similar to the one portrayed on tonight's program. If you should make the mistake of giving one of them the opportunity, he will not only mulct you of your money, but he might even, as has been pointed out, cost you your very life. According to medical authorities, certain forms of cancer caught in their early stages can be cured. But do not conduct your own diagnosis. If you suspect cancer, go to a reputable doctor who is quite likely to find that you do not have cancer at all. Beware of the charlatans who call themselves doctors without the legal right to do so. They are the ones who promise every patient anything the patient wants to hear. It is also well to remember that these quacks cannot affect recovery in any cancer case, no matter how early it is caught. So if you happen across one of them, across a pseudo-doctor who promises to cure cancer in any stage... Do your duty to yourself and to your fellow citizens. Go to the nearest phone and call your local police. Tonight's file continues in a room at the Farwell Police Station. What have you got there, Jim? Oh, it's a map of the territory between the traffic control station and here. Oh, let's lay it out. Okay. 
Hold that corner down there, will you? Yeah. Now, let's take a look. Where is it? Oh, here's the traffic station where Auburn was seen. Let's put a pin there, huh? Mm-hmm. Got it. Here's the gas station where he stopped last night at 8.30. Check. Now we'll jump all the way down into town. He parked his car in front of a liquor store on 2nd. Here it is, 2nd and Main at 9.45. Put a pin there, will you? Okay. Now, uh, the last pin... I mean, well, the last pin goes back up here, other side of town. That's a station where he got air for a bad tire. That was at uh, 10 o'clock sharp. Now, that means the car came all the way through town to the liquor store, then headed back the way it came. So we can discard everything past this last gas station so far as searching is concerned. Right. However, we must assume that Auburn was headed for some place in Farwell or up here on the outskirts. So we'll confine our search from this pencil line to this one. Well, I'll take the territory north of Main Street. Right. Yeah, have you got the copies of Auburn's picture? Yeah, yeah. Here you are. Good. Okay, let's start looking, Ken. Check back here every half hour. Good morning, Dr. Smith. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Wilson. Oh, doctor, this is Mrs. Douglas. She's the friend I told you about. How do you do, Mrs. Hello. Douglas? Doctor, I'd... Um... I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes, if I may. Well, certainly. Just as soon as I finish Mrs. Wilson's treatment. Oh, may I speak with you before you treat Mrs. Wilson? Well... You see, um, one thing I wanted to discuss is the way you're treating her. Oh, precisely what is it you'd like to know? Um, your qualifications. Well, I'm not used to having them questioned. Well, I'm not used to having my closest friend treated for cancer. Perhaps you'd like to see Mrs. Wilson's x-rays. Oh, no, no, thank you. I never could read them. Well, then I do wish you'd get to the point. I, um, I understand that Mrs. Wilson came to you through an advertisement in the newspaper. That's right. May I see your medical diploma, please? It burned when I had a fire in my last office. What school is it from? I don't see what importance that has. Grace? Yes. Unless you see some satisfactory proof that this gentleman is qualified to treat you, I not only would refuse to be his patient, but I'd call the police. Oh, Lucy, please. Mrs. Wilson, I release you as my patient. Oh, but, Doctor, she If you have to hesitate about remaining under my care, even for a second, I must wash my hands of the entire case. Oh, please, Dr. Smith, I'm sorry. Nothing can change my decision. I must request that you both leave. Oh, dear. Well, all right. Good day. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. Alma. Alma. Yes, what is it? Go pack our bags. We're getting out of here. Jim, I hear the police located our bogus doctor. That's right, Ken. How did that happen? Well, a woman named Mrs. Douglas called in here while we were out. She registered a complaint against a man named Dr. Smith. He was treating a friend of hers for cancer, but she stopped it. The sergeant on duty who took the call went right over to the address the woman gave, but the doctor and his nurse had gone. Oh. But he did find George Auburn there. He'd been poisoned. Dead? No, fortunately, he was able to be revived. How about the radium? This Smith and his nurse took that with them. Are they traveling in the stolen car, Jim? No, Smith is using his own car. Any description on that one? No, none at all. Oh, fine. Auburn was questioned after being revived, but he was unable to give any rational statements to the police doctor. What was stymied again? Not entirely, Ken. A neighbor saw Smith and the girl turn onto Highway 9, headed west. How long ago did they leave? Within the last 15 minutes. Are you sure? Yes, the woman who registered the complaint said she and her friend were there 15 minutes ago. Ken, if the university can help us, we might be able to catch them. Come on. <laughs> How'd you know there was a drawbridge on this road? It's not on the map. Now, this is the way our train came last night. That's what gave me the idea of having it open now to stop Smith and the girl. Hey, hey, it's working. Stop the car, Ken. Come on, let's get out and walk. Right. I'll slide out that way, Jim. Okay. Yeah. Can you carry the case? Yeah, right. Swan. It's one of these cars right along here. 
We're very close. Mm -hmm. This is the car. Would you step out of the car, please? Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. What do you want? Two needles of radium, for one thing. I don't know what you're talking about. A Geiger counter never lies. You hear it? Now, both of you will please step out onto the road. George Auburn was sentenced in a federal court to 10 years for violation of the National Motor Theft Act. For his mistreatment of a former patient, which caused the patient's death, the bogus doctor was turned over to local authorities for prosecution of manslaughter. Every special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation undergoes a rigorous period of training before he gets his credentials. That training includes many things. The use of firearms, the art of investigation, a smattering of law, the taking and the giving of evidence so that it is presentable in court, and other courses that enable the graduate better to do his job. One of those courses teaches the would-be agent how to adapt the latest in science to his use. Teaches him, for instance, that the Geiger counter can help him locate a criminal who might otherwise almost be beyond reach, even as the bogus doctor would have been in tonight's case. Every special agent, like every other person, possesses intuition, and there are times when the temptation to follow that intuition is almost overpowering. But the Federal Bureau of Investigation has taught its members that there is a mightier weapon. And that weapon is the one which led to the solution of tonight's case. That weapon is knowledge. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, a word to the wives. Let's consider the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan from the woman's point of view. While her husband lives, she has extra protection from the plan's special cash fund, which can be used if sickness or unemployment threaten home security. If her husband dies, the mortgage is automatically canceled. For full information, see your Equitable Society representative without delay. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A factual account of the pursuit and arrest of a cunning criminal. Its subject, blackmail. It's titled, The Larsonous Landlady. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Eleanor Audley, B. Benaderet, Rye Billsbury, Herb Butterfield, Bill Johnstone, and Mary Ship. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the larcenous landlady on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.